Hello, my name is Giorgio. I'm a graduate in art history, and today I'm your guide to one of the most prestigious noble palaces in the entire city, which for the first time opens its doors for the Roli days. This is Palazzo Fieschi Negroni. The building was commissioned in 1612 by the Ravascheri family and was completed in 1618 by the architect Bartolomeo Massoni based on a design by one of the masters of Italian architecture, Vincenzo Scamozzi. In 1614, the palazzo was included in the Rolli lists and took up its role as one of the most prestigious hosts for prominent local and foreign dignitaries of the period. Going back only a little in time to the early 19th century, we would see a radically different urban fabric from the current one. In fact, during the 19th century, this area underwent a major urban renewal, aimed at improving and creating new roads. All the buildings on these roads were either demolished or very substantially modified, and this was the case also of Palazzo Fieschi Negroni. In fact, its façade was physically detached from the building and then moved backwards about three meters, maintaining the same original features. We're now standing in a room frescoed by one of the major painters of the second half of the 17th century, Domenico Piola, who designed the scene visible above our heads, known as the myth of Dawn and Cephalus. A characteristic of this room, in addition to its indisputable artistic value, lies in its tangible evidence of the repositioning of the façade during the first half of the 19th century. In fact, in 1846, the Genoese painter Isola had to hide the result of the cut, which is still evident today on the band under the central medallion. A further unusual aspect lies in the choice of its theme. Piola, chosen by Giovanni Battista Negroni in the 1680s, opted for this mythological love story. He probably decided, together with his client, to use this tale to exalt the marriage between Tomasino Fieschi and Giovanni Battista Negroni, which took place in 1681. In this room, therefore, the qualities and particularities of Piola's artistic language stand out, at least in the surviving parts. Notably, his academic devotion to the absolute precision of the result and the importance of respecting his client's requests, here highlighting the desire to celebrate the union between two important families, Fieschi and Negroni. We are now in the second hall housing frescoes by Domenico Piola. And, as in the previous room, we once again find the principal characteristics of Piola's artistic language. The incredible perfection in drawing, which might even be defined as academic. A further particularity distinguishes this specific work. That is the involvement of the great Bolognese quadraturist Antonio Hafner. What was a quadraturist? He was a support figure for the painter and was responsible for the spatial division of the scenes that were to be represented. This room, which houses scenes of Apollo and Mercury among the muses, reflects all the features which are mentioned above and in no small part thanks to Hafner's work, the vision of the space through the use of elusive architecture allows an enlargement of the decorative space, giving it the actual dimensions of the room an unexpected width. 
nella sua dimensione, fornendo quasi un effetto ottico di il naturale ambiente. We are now entering the room which represents the real particularity and magnificent uniqueness of this palazzo, the room of public well-being, frescoed by Sebastiano Galeotti in 1730. This fresco was commissioned in 1730 by Ambrogio Negroni, who opted for an allegorical rather than mythological theme, a choice probably suggested by Galeotti with the aim of exalting the figure of Ambrogio Negroni who had been a senator of the Genoese Republic since 1725 and was an important public and political figure and needed to embody specific values which were here depicted as, the allegor as allegorical figures. Fame, the god of abundance, wealth and credit. Values which were fundamental to guarantee the greatest purpose, public well-being. This is the last room and was entirely frescoed by Galeotti in 1730 with his depiction of the allegory of the triumph of the noble arts. In this fresco, the perfection of drawing and the strength of the colors stands out in all its glory. The artistic language of the Tuscan painter can be easily appreciated. His structure is layered on a very precise and extremely detailed line drawing. This fact is evident in the figures in the foreground above the cornice, illustrated in the very smallest of details, while, as you proceed in the perspective background, this precision is lost. This constitutes a unique and fundamental element of the painter's technique that structurally arranges the fresco on a succession of different perspective planes approaching the background on the basis of the laws of optics. The study, based on progressively diminishing planes, is associated with an equally precise choice of, of a range of colors used to support this perspective outcome. In fact, this skillful use of color ranges also contributes to enhancing the representation of the laws of optics. This is especially evident in the shades of red. All around the main scene are arranged the various allegories of the noble arts. But let us focus on the figures of mathematics and architecture. Mathematics is depicted as a middle-aged woman with a globe under her arm, flanked by a putto representing a student, while in her other hand she carries a tablet with two engraved geometric figures, a circle and a triangle, along with the numbers 17 and 30, or rather 1730 the year in which the fresco was painted. Architecture, on the other hand, is depicted as a young woman dressed in yellow with a plan in one hand and a compass in the other. She is intent on drawing a sign on the plan. The plan was the original blueprint of this palazzo by Scamozzi, published in his Treaty on Universal Architecture in 1615. These two biographical references underline the historical and cultural importance of this magnificent Genoese palazzo. Thank you.